but we're going to stay together here. We're, we're doing a series right now in the book of Haggai. Uh, we did Zephaniah before that, and Haggai now, and so uh, we're going to jump into that reading. Haggai follows Zephaniah, and just kind of as a quick recap, in Zephaniah, the prophecy is all about coming wrath and destruction. Uh, what happens is the Babylonians come in and they do wipe out Judah, destroy the temple, and all those other things. So we get to Haggai, uh, a bunch of time has passed, they've been in exile, they've now been uh, able to return home to Judah, but it's destroyed and devastated. They've been there for 18 years or so and haven't rebuilt the temple, so last week God said to them, what's the story? Why are you building your houses? Why do your places look so great? You've done nothing for my house to, to build this temple. Uh, so it's really all about priorities. Uh, so we're going to continue in that chapter, uh, starting at verse 12. This is what God says to us. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. The people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message. Of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we spend some time reflecting on your words through the prophet Haggai, this could seem very removed from us. This is over 2,000 years old. Uh, we're not rebuilding a temple. We don't live in the land of Judah. We don't know who Shealtiel and Josedach are, God, but we trust that as your word is living and active that you want to speak to us this morning through these words and through this prophet and that it will be relevant and significant for us. And so as we spend this time uh, just working through this reading, I pray that you would do exactly that that you would speak, and that, that it would be loud and clear, and that we'd receive it as truth straight from you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start with a question. How many of you want God's blessing on your life? Grant, you didn't raise your hand. And I'm pointing, you do not want God's blessing. You do. Okay. Okay. How many? Let's try that again. You know, if you ask a question in a classroom with kids, like if you ask for a volunteer or something, they all have their hand way up even before the question's done. I, I need a volunteer. Ooh, that's me, right? They're like, pick me, pick me. They don't even know what the volunteer is for, right? I need a volunteer to clean the toilets. Pick me, pick me. They don't care. For some reason here, even when the answer is true for us, we're like, meh. I don't really need to. He knows. The Lord knows. Pastor Ian knows. How many of you would like God's blessing in your life? Yes, absolutely. I think that we all do. I, in fact, I think you should just turn to someone right now and just say, I want God's blessing. It doesn't really seem like you do. It's almost like, it's almost like at a big dinner where you say, can you please pass me the vegetables? But you know, you're just getting them just so you have some on your plate. You have no intention of eating them and you don't really want them. Turn back and say, I want God's blessing. Oh, man. Okay, we are on our way now. This morning, I've got, I think I've got such a great message from God for you. And here, here it is. Here is the secret for God's blessing in your life. And I don't know why. I should really not be telling you. I should really be on a, a speaker circuit right now. Or I should be selling a book, right? And be making my empire and my fortune. Because this is so good, right? Haven't you, maybe some of you have even bought books before trying to sort out how to get God's blessing in your life. Are there speakers right now traveling around? You've got to buy a big ticket, spend a bunch of money so you can hear about how to get God's blessing. I'm giving it away for free this morning. We took the offering already. You put in what you put in. We're not going to pass it once more. What do you say? Oh, yeah, he really nailed it. I absolutely get God's blessing now. Here's the secret. I just want you to know the generosity of God. Here's the secret for having God's blessing in your life. I'm going to read it once more. We'll put it on the screen. See if you can just pick it out. It's right here in this passage. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. Uh, Zerubbabel's the governor. Uh, Joshua, the high priest. And the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai. 
Because the Lord their God had sent him. Let's stop right there. Where, where's the key for God's blessing? It's in that sentence. They obeyed. They obeyed God. Can you believe it? How often would you just love it if you'd say something and people would obey you? Right? Would you look on them with favor? Like parents, you're nodding a little too emphatically, right? You're like, absolutely. I'd love that. They obeyed. So often God's people hear, but don't do. Or they listen, but don't do. Or even us, we know it. We even would say that we believe it, but we don't do it. We don't obey it. Remember last week he was saying to them, you're working yourselves to the bone. You've got no food. You drink, you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, you're still cold. You do not have my blessing. The key to getting God's blessing is to obey him. I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. He's given us everything we need to know in the Bible. If it's not in there, then it's up to your, uh, up to your dis- discretion, right? Search, search God's word, uh, pray about it, look for his leading. But if you should take this job or that job, it's not in there. You just pray about that, uh, get some trusted counsel, and then you just move forward, knowing that you're walking in God's blessing. Here's the thing. Why did they obey God? Why? This message comes from this guy, Haggai. I can tell you, Haggai's a nobody. He's just a regular guy, right? One day he's just doing whatever. He's farming his land or he's taking care of his flocks or whatever. The next day he's a prophet. He did not go to seminary in Edmonton. I promise you that. Just because I went to seminary doesn't mean I've got God's word more than you do. Why would they listen to Haggai? Why do they receive it? Why do they trust it? Because they believe that it's from the Lord. They believe that God has given Haggai this message. They obey it, it says in the next sentence, and the people feared the Lord. Maybe you've heard a verse before. Um, The what of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Fear. Fear. You have heard that one before. Good work. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Does that mean we live in terror every day? God's going to get me. God's going to zap me. I'm so worried about this. Oh, I sinned. He's so angry with me now. No, we we don't have to live in fear 24-7 of God's incredible strength and power that he's going to use it to crush us. There's this aspect to fear that is often kind of drawn out or pulled out or or intended in the Bible where it's uh, a reverence and an awe. I'm just overwhelmed by God. I'm just overwhelmed by his power. I'm overwhelmed by his strength. I'm drawn in to worship him. They fear God and they don't run from him in fear and terror. Instead, they cling to him. Right? Oh, man, he is just so powerful. I'm, I'm staying with this guy. I'm clinging on to this guy. If my children are scared, they, they will run and cling on to me or to their mom. Uh, they're afraid and that fear drives them closer to, not further away. These people have been ignoring God. They've been putting God off for 18 years. Uh, Haggai brings this message. Why are you doing this? You need to check out your priorities. Check what you're doing. You know, what's your attitude? Where's your heart? They hear from God. They take it as truth. And they obey and fear the Lord. They cling to him. It says this, that it's a remnant. Remnant means not much, right? It's like the crumbs. You eat a cake and there's crumbs left over. This is a small group. Uh, some uh, theologians or, or scholars estimate it's maybe only 4,000 people in Judah now. It's this really, really, really small group. Everyone else has been sent out into exile. Others have just scattered and given up on the hope. And, and so it's just a small group that are left. Do you ever feel like you're alone following Jesus? I do. Absolutely, I do sometimes. Even though we gather here and I I see the 250 of you each week, sometimes I feel like I'm just alone in this. Last summer, one of my good friends came. He was in my wedding party, and while we were visiting, he shared that he's agnostic now. He just doesn't know if there's God or not. Right on the fence, and could go either way. I heard this week that another friend of mine has decided there is no God. Uh, Used to believe in God, used to be super involved, and has kind of withdrawn, and now he's decided no God at all. And it makes me feel like, God, am, am I alone in this? Is it? Is this us? Is this the remnant that's left in this little room? Because it feels like everyone else is going off doing what they want. And everyone else is believing what they want to believe. And everyone else is becoming or doing whatever it is that they want. And sometimes I feel like the remnant. That I'm all alone. 
if that's you sometimes, you're not alone. You're not alone in feeling that way. Remember Elijah the prophet? There was a super powerful, uh, engaging prophet in the Old Testament, and he did incredible things. He he, uh, parted uh, parted a sea with his cloak, and he called down fire from heaven, and just like, uh, just not just a little flicker or a flame, but this just roaring, raging fire. He outran chariots. I mean, this guy did all sorts of different miraculous things, and at the end of all those things, he withdraws and he asks God, can I please just die? I just feel so alone in this. I'm the only one, he says to God. Another person in the Bible who felt really alone was Jesus. We read about Jesus. He's described as a man of sorrows, a man who lived out in lonely places. Uh, I mean, nearing the end of his life, the last day or two of his life, he tries to get some friends together to pray. He can't find three guys to pray with him. Man, this is so desperate. This, I'm just so in need. I just need your encouragement and your support so much. Come and pray with me. Right? They're just snoring away. It's a lonely place to be. I just need some encouragement and help. And he's all, all alone. On the cross when Jesus dies, Jesus feels totally cut off. My God, why have you abandoned? Why have you forsaken? Why have you turned away from me? He doesn't even feel any intimacy or closeness with his very own father. Sometimes you just feel alone. You feel like that remnant. Man, I'm trying to be faithful, but I'm the only one. And maybe I should listen to what those people are doing, or maybe I should listen to what those people are saying. Maybe I should buy that book or follow that teaching. Or, you know, maybe if we were just a bit more accepting, maybe if I was a bit more open-minded, there'd be more people I could relate to and interact with. And yet maybe you still feel like that remnant, and maybe you're called to be that remnant. I mean, maybe right now in Canada, as we see people uh, turn away from Christianity and turn away from religion in general and t- just turn away from any sort of structure, really, Maybe we're called to be that faithful voice, a small but faithful witness right here in Cloverdale or Surrey or Langley or White Rock, whatever neighborhood you're in. It keeps going. It says this, Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. I think this is one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible, uh, really. Just as we think about God's presence uh, with his people, in the first verses of the chapter 1, he says, what are you doing? Turn back to me. And then we already read this morning, then they obeyed. Then they did it. They come back to God, and there's just this transformation that happens. They obey, and they fear God. And then right here, what's the blessing in that? What's the reward in that? God says right away, I'm with you. God, we feel all alone. We feel like we're, we're starving, we're hungry, we're worked to the bone, we're cold, we're lonely, we're isolated, we're threatened. And God says, I'm with you. I'm with you. You turn back to me and I'm here. I'm here for you. I'm here to defend you. I'm, I'm present with you. You have my blessing again. I'm just going to pour it all out on you. I'm with you and I'm for you. You know, it's very possible to be loved but not blessed. I was thinking this week about, uh, in my household growing up, we had this rule, I've shared a bit of this before, but there was only one rule in my family, and it was, it's strange that there was just this one rule, two rules, I guess. The one rule was, you had to have the truck back before dad left for work in the morning, right? That was our curfew. (laughs) Dad's leaving for work, and if you're not home, there's big trouble. One time I wasn't home, and he started phoning my friend's houses at five in the morning. I need my son, where's my truck? Anyway, the other rule I want to talk about is this, no dating till you're 16, There should be shock and horror at that, right? Because as a 15-year-old, I knew way better than my parents did. And so I chose to disregard that rule. It was a bad idea. So what happened is I started to date this girl, and let's just say that her name was Carly, and the moment I started to date her, the blessing in my house left. My parents' blessing left me, and now there was just judgment and curse and consequence, right? And it was tangible. It was palpable. You could feel it in the room. Whenever I went, whenever I interacted with my parents, there was this weight, and so I thought, well, I'm smarter than these guys. I'm going to date this girl. We're going to get married, and uh, you know, all those types of things you're thinking about when you're 15, and good things, smart things, and uh, super smart at 15, smarter than most people, and certainly than my parents. 
And so I decided, well, I'll just lie to my parents, right? Because that's a good avenue to go on, first to disobey and then to disregard and lie to. And I said, oh, yeah, we, we broke up. We broke up. No problem. We broke up. That's over. And then, um, but there was still a heaviness in the house because my parents are a little bit smarter than I thought. And I think they were still on to me. And so one day we're having dinner as a family, and this is the only time I ever did this in my life. So I believe it was God's leading. I brought my uh, boom box down to the kitchen, uh, to the dining room, and I turned on the radio. And on the radio, there was this all request hour. And so as we're eating dinner, then on comes this voice. Hi, this is Carly. I want to dedicate a song to my boyfriend, Ian. (laughs) 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 The blessing (laughs) vanished once more. Right? I was loved. Absolutely, my parents loved me, but the blessing was gone. And maybe you've had that experience with your own families, either with your parents or your kids or uh, at work. You're still loved and appreciated, but the blessing is gone. And I found that just a, a disturbing place to be. My family is very gracious, very loving, very accepting, but this was not okay. Eventually, you know how that story works out, right? Carla and I got married and lived happily ever after. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell my wife, Miranda, right? No, it didn't work out. It unraveled. I decided at some point that it was better to live with my parents' blessing than it was to continue this relationship with this, uh, with this girl. Decided that there was uh, just untenable, unacceptable to live with their love, but not their blessing. God's people have been living with his love, but not his blessing. That's what we see in Haggai. That's what we uh, saw in Zephaniah. You guys have gone way off track, and you need to come back. I'm still your God, but you, I've removed my blessing from you. you. You're gathering your crops, you're doing all your hard work, but I'm not blessing that. You know, you think it's going to be a bumper crop, but there's nothing there. Why? Because I've removed my blessing. Come back to me, obey me, listen to me, follow me, trust me, walk with me, and then my blessing will return. What's the key to having God's blessing in your life? Obedience. Walk with him, follow him, trust him, listen to him. The people obeyed his voice and they feared him. And God said, I'm with you. I'm right there with you. I'm for you. Don't look around and say, oh, there's only, there's only 4,000 of us. There's only a few of us left. Don't look around and say, oh, our enemies are all around us. Don't look and say, there's nothing in the cupboard. There's no, no money in our, in our wallet or our purse. Don't look at any of that. Just look here at me. I'm with you. I'm for you. I've brought my blessing back to you, and I'm your God, and you will be my people, and just watch and wait and see how I bless you now. I think for some of us, we want to say, well, God loves me. Absolutely, he does, but you can live your whole life outside of his blessing. How? By living in disobedience. Yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I want to do this. I said, I'm not, I'm not going to bless you in that. I'm not going to bless you in your sinfulness. I'm not going to bless you in your idolatry. I'm not going to bless you in your affair. I'm not going to bless you in your addiction, your struggles with pornography. I'm not going to bless that time. I'm not going to bless you as long as you keep pursuing that. He said, God removes his blessing until we come back to him. And he just keeps on calling, keeps on inviting. It reminds me of the prodigal son with his father, right? The father's blessing was gone. But the moment he stepped back in, he didn't even get back into the house before the blessing had returned, for the Father was waiting to welcome him back. God says, come back to me and I will bless you. I'll be with you. If you don't feel God's comfort and blessing and presence, then maybe you're being disobedient and unfaithful to him. Verse 14 says this, So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. God says, I'm with you, and now is enough. Their hearts are stirred. All of a sudden, they've got all this energy, this hope, this enthusiasm, this comfort, this joy, this peace. We can do this. God is with us. This is going to happen. This is going to be okay. Immediately, as long as they, as long as they, as soon as they experience that blessing, their hearts are stirred. It reminds me of after the resurrection, Jesus uh, encounters these two disciples walking down the road, right? Remember that story, the road to Emmaus? And then after he leaves, they say, didn't our hearts burn within us? Didn't we have such joy and hope? Wasn't it so incredible just being in God's presence, having Jesus right here with us? 
It's exactly what God is reminding them of here. I'm with you. And that just fills them up. They've got everything they need. Suddenly the coldness is gone and suddenly the harvests are looking better and they know that it's going to be okay all because God is with them, all because God's blessing has returned to them. They might be outnumbered. They might be struggling financially. They might be hungry, thirsty, cold, but their hearts are filled with this hope and this joy. He gives us the date at the end. I said last week, Haggai is a book of dates, and it happens in a short period of time. If you remember, chapter 1 starts on the first day of the month. Here we are on the uh, 24th now, right? Three weeks. Three weeks later, and they're building. So that means from the time that they received this message, they've already got the blueprints. They've got the plan in place. They've organized maybe teams of workers. Maybe they've gotten supplies already. They haven't just been sitting around for three weeks saying, maybe we'll start to obey. Maybe we'll turn. I'm on the fence. I'm thinking about it. I think this happens right away. God says, come back to me. They respond. They obey. They fear God. They cling to him. And God says, I'm with you. And they're ready to go. How often do we say, I'll repent or I'll obey later? Right? Ever ask a child to clean their room? Right? Like sometimes, yes, I'll clean my room. When? <laughs> when I move out, when I'm 20, right? Or when I move into your basement and live there forever because that's all I can afford, right? I mean, when are we going to obey God? When are we going to turn back? How many of you know that what you're doing and the things you're pursuing are wrong and disobedient to God, but you're okay with it and you're just flirting with it and still courting it? Just like me and my girlfriend, we're still trying to just sneak along, right? And it's going to be okay. And the blessing is not there. God, I'm just, why are you so distant? Why do you seem so far off? Why are things so hard for me right now? And God says, because you're still walking away from me. You're still going in the other direction. And giving me lip service and showing up at church once in a while doesn't cut it. Because God searches our hearts. He knows our thoughts, our minds, our anxious thoughts. And he knows all the places we're off track. And if you want God to bless you in your disobedience, you're delusional. He immediately removes that blessing. Why? So that you will come back so that you will obey, so that you will fear him, so that you can be blessed by him. Is it possible to go to church your whole life and know Jesus and still be disobedient? Absolutely. Uh, People do that all the time. I do that. I've had seasons of my life where I've been very disobedient in certain areas, and I've wanted and expected God to bless me in that. Of course he doesn't. Do you bless your children in their disobedience? Probably not. Here's some money, here's some treats, you know, oh, we're going to throw a party for you. You've been, you know, shouting and lying and kicking and screaming and disobeying. Let's do something to celebrate this. Of course you wouldn't do that. Three weeks later, they're ready to go. They've obeyed. They fear God. They're clinging to him with all they've got. They know that he's there. Their hearts are encouraged and stirred up. They're ready to go. I like how it uses twice in this uh, little section. It says, their God. They came out and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. They've decided who their God will be. And they've chosen, this is our God. This is who we're going to follow. This is who we're listening to. This is who we're going to obey. This is who we're going to fear. Church, who is your God? Who are you listening to and looking for support from and finding your comfort in? What is that person? What is that thing? Anybody got their cell phone here? Can I borrow somebody's cell phone? Right here. Oh, I'm going to take this one. This one looks nice. Oh, this is the beauty. It's newer than mine. Do you know who your God is? Who is your God? I mean, think about it. Who gets all your time and attention? I mean, don't our phones have the capacity to become our God's? We just trust in it. We're nervous without it. He's feeling very scared right now. I will set you free from your God. Yeah! Right? (laughs) Who else needs to be released this morning? Do we turn to these for comfort? Are we constantly checking in? Whenever it dings or rings or chimes, do we stop everything else mid-conversation with someone else? Maybe even our spouse or someone very close to us. Just hold on a second. Right? Take a look. Then sometimes we'll say this, oh, I'm not going to take it. Go on, oh, blessed one. I've chosen to talk to you first, right? 
This is a close second. We keep it in our hand while we're talking to people just in case, right? It's telling them, you're pretty important, but this is close behind, right? Is this our God? Maybe it is. Church, I would encourage you to start thinking about who is my God? Who gets my time, my attention, my devotion? Who do I look for for trust and support? I'd encourage you to just take a sticky note and just be honest about it, right? From now on, leave your Bible at home, right? Stop, pray- stop praying curled up on your bed, envisioning God up in heaven and listening. Just put this on a little table and pray to it. Right? If this is your God, then let's just be honest and let's do it. God, here you are. I love you and adore you. I worship you. I plug you. I give you everything you need. And you give me everything I need. Right? Battery life's looking low. I'm going to take care of you and plug you in. Right? And we rub it and we stroke it. <laughs> right? Maybe this is your... I'm going to give this back because it's getting awkward <laughs> as I start snuggling up. Church, who is your God? What's your God? I know we want to jump to and say, Jesus is. But are you obeying him? Are you listening to him? Are you more tuned into what's on Netflix? Right? Go home, take a sticky note, put it on your TV. This is my God. Right? Or maybe it's your fridge and your belly. Let's just be honest. Yeah? I am ruled by this right here. Or maybe, maybe it's your own brain and you just rationalize everything. If I can't figure it out, it's not meant to be figured. God's a bit of an enigma to me right? I'm, it's all up here. And I pick and choose. This is one way that Christ, all sorts of Christians and all sorts of people make themselves their own God. I will pick and choose what I'm going to follow of God's and what I'm not, right? How, how true is that of Christians in the world? I will pick and choose. Oh, God said that, but that was for that time and that place and those people. He doesn't mean that for me, right? Who's God? Me. Right? Oh, yeah, well, he said that, but that was a bit of a different culture, and I understand it a little bit differently. Who's God? Me. I will pick and choose what God said. Maybe you shouldn't write God. Maybe you should write Baal, right? And just be honest, this is worship. This is idol worship. This is something else. How many of you worship your kids? Right? Their every cry, every wish, every demand, right? You can go home, just get a sticky note, just put it right on your kid's head. <laughs> <laughs> He said, he said, what's it say? <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> For How true is that? I mean, we want to say, God, yes, I'm following you. I'm listening to you. But all the time we've got our phone in our hand. And we're listening to our kids. and We're checking what's on TV. And we're checking the fridge. And we're making our list. And we're siphoning out. And we're filtering what God has to say to us. And we're God. Or our kids are God. Or our phone is God. Or our schedule is God. Or our, our, our career is God. Or whatever it is. We make all sorts of different things God. And when we do that, we stop listening and obeying Him. We stop clinging to Him for all of our hope and comfort and protection. And we stop experiencing His blessing. And we go way outside of where He wants us to be. And we live with His love. Where He cares deeply about us. But it's a distant love where he is no longer with us. Isn't God with me everywhere I go? Yeah, but when you go to that party or when you're watching that on, uh, on the internet, when you're looking at that, when you're communicating like that, God is not there with his love and with his blessing. If you want God to bless your life, start obeying him. Start fearing and clinging to him and start trusting his promise that he is with you. How do we... How do we see that transpire now? How do we know that God is with us? We go back to his word, even to those weird prophets like Zephaniah and Haggai, and we read again about real people who faced real struggles and encountered the real presence of God. How do we know that God is with us? We can look back to the cross and say, oh yeah, this isn't just decoration, and this isn't just jewelry. This is actually a reminder for me every time I see it that God is present and with me and for me. So much so that his son comes to us, not just prophets or priests or kings, but God himself comes to us with his presence and his blessing. And he blesses me through his life. And he blesses me through his teaching. He blesses me through his death on the cross. He blesses me through his resurrection. He wants to bless us in just a minute again at his table as he meets us there with his very own body and blood and his forgiveness. God comes to us in his blessing. Where is he now? Well, he comes to you in blessing at the baptismal font. He comes to you in blessing at this table. He comes to you in blessing through his word as you read it. He comes to you in blessing as you pray and listen for his voice. He comes to you in blessing as he calls you back. Come back to me. Stop walking down that path. Stop going in that direction. Come back and feel the fullness 
of my closeness and my blessing in your life. Church, the, the key to having God's blessing in your life is to obey Him, to cling to Him and trust Him. May we be people who love God and live in obedience and in the abundance of His blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.